Hi, hello, this is Job Aguas, and welcome once again to our lecture in ethics and moral philosophy. This is now our third lecture, and for this lecture, I will focus on uh, ethics, uh, religion, and law. So how are these areas of areas or disciplines relate to one another? Because the, there is or there are uh, uh, overlappings, so we should say, between or among ethics, religion, and law. They are intimately connected because, uh, for one, they have one thing. They have one thing in common. They all talk about uh, human behaviors, human action. Okay, they have something to say about how we should act uh, properly in the society, okay? morally or religiously or legally in society. So I will talk about first the relationship between ethics and religion. So religion and ethics may overlap and they may influence each other, but definitely they are, they are different and can be independent of each other. First, we have already defined what ethics is. So let me just give you a very general uh, introduction or general description of religion. So when you say religion, it has something to do with our belief in the supernatural being, in the divine being, in the absolute, in God. And believers uh, consider God to be a lawgiver. So God makes commands. Okay, so he has, he, he, uh, he gave the believers, instituted certain precepts, laws binding on the believers. And therefore, the believer in that particular religion is duty bound to follow the commands of God. So in effect, because of these commands of God, the commandments of the divine being, in a, in a religion, there is now a set of moral principles, moral laws. Okay religious moral laws that one must follow if he wants to be uh, uh, a devoted follower of that particular religion take for example in christianity uh, in christianity the christians believe that god gave the ten commandments and therefore uh, the christians must follow the ten commandments not just the christians including the Jews, because we share, the Christians and the Jews share the same uh, 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 tradition, religious tradition, the Judeo-Christian tradition. In Islam, uh, our brothers Muslim follow the Quran, and in the Quran, Allah also gave his uh, commandments uh, to, the, to the Muslims. So, uh, because of these commands, because of these uh, precepts coming from the divine being, people tend to relate religion and ethics because most of the religions, they have their moral codes, not just the monotheistic religions that I have, that I have mentioned. Even the, even the other, the non-monotheistic religions like Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, Taoism, and Confucianism, they have their own moral codes, right? But of course, some of these uh, religions are different, meaning they don't believe in the supreme divine being, one supreme being like the monotheist religions. But you can see the relationship between religion, religious belief, and <clears throat> ethics. So there is a tendency to, to overlap uh, one another. And so, as I've said, some religions provide ethical norms or rules of conduct, like the, men, the three monotheistic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Now, some ethical norms are outside the confines of religions, meaning uh, the, the ethical norms, the moral codes, are not exclusive to religions. Because there are 
ethical norms that are outside of religion. Meaning, like for example, a person may not be religious, and by 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 religious we mean that he follows the ways, the teachings, the doctrines of a particular religion. Okay, uh, one can be ethical without following these doctrines of a particular religion because one can actually be outside of a particular religion so it does not follow that if you are not religious you cannot be ethical or moral because you cannot still be ethical or moral even if you don't uh, subscribe to a particular religious belief or tradition okay so the, the, there is a connection between the two there is a relationship between the two but they are not absolutely the same okay that you always have to be religious in order to be ethical and by the way there is also a distinction between being religious and spiritual okay when you say spiritual uh, a person may be spiritual because he acknowledges the divine being okay uh, so he acknowledges the supernatural being but acknowledging the supernatural or divine being does not always mean that you are within a particular religious tradition okay so these are these two are different now is it possible to be ethical without being spiritual of course it's possible to be moral to be ethical without being religious or spiritual okay so you can say that uh, being ethical is not exclusive to those people who are religious and spiritual okay uh, helping others is not something that is exclusive to the christians or to the muslims or to the buddhists you no know? uh, people who do not belong to any particular uh, religious denomination or religion can still do good to others you no know? so that's the, the relationship between ethics and religion now let's go to the next point the relationship between ethics and law okay between the ethical and legal now just a very general description of what a law is a law is an ordinance of reason so ordinance ordinance means a command a precept okay a precept so an ordinance commands you to do something okay now it's an ordinance of reason it's a command of reason it's so it's it's a command that is coming from reason all right now what is the purpose of the law <clears throat> the purpose of the law is to serve the common good okay to serve the common good to promote justice all right to protect or preserve the rights of individuals that is the purpose of the law. So the law must always be just. All right? Now, we talk we talk in ethics about being just because it's moral to be just. And therefore, there is the connection between ethics and law. Because again, ethics and law, they both talk about how to behave properly, justly, ethically, morally in a society or in a community or even by yourself. Right, so there is the connection between the law and ethics. Now, there are many different types of law. Right, first, the eternal law, and then the divine, then the natural, and the human. So let's discuss these types of laws. They are actually in a hierarchy, one by one. When you say eternal law, it is the expression of God's providence. It is the ordinance of God based on his divine intelligence or based on his divine will so god created the world all right god created the world and when he created the world he promulgated laws into his creation all right now we cannot know the exact the extent of the mind of god so we cannot know the full extent of the eternal law all right because we cannot, we cannot understand, we cannot fully comprehend the mind of God. God is absolute. His knowledge, his intelligence is, you know, without bound, without limit. 
in our mind, our reason cannot fully understand this. So we cannot fully understand the law of God because we cannot understand the whole extent of his intelligence. But because we have reason, okay, God created us with reason, therefore we can also understand the laws because we have reason. So if it is an ordinance of reason and we have reason, then we can also understand the laws of God, but in a very limited way because our reason is limited compared to the law or to the, to the mind of God. All right. Now, the second type of law is the divine law. This is the law of God that he revealed to us or revealed to the believers. Right. And we can find this divine law in the Holy Scriptures, in the Bible. All right. So the laws that are in the scriptures, in the Bible, in the Old and New Testaments, they are divine laws. They are expressed, revealed by God. In Islam, there is also the divine law because they have the Holy Scripture, the Holy Quran. So Allah also gave his laws to the Muslims. Okay. Now, of course, if you're going to compare the laws that you can find in the scriptures, in the Bible, the Christian Bible, in, in the Torah for the for the Jew, and in in Islam, you can see some parallelisms or commonalities because, of course, they were of course uh, instituted or given by God. We call God with different names, but it's the same God, okay? The same God that the monotheists uh, follow. So that is the divine law. Now you have to be a believer in order to for you to know the divine law. Because if you are not a believer, then you are not going to receive the revelation or you will not subscribe to the scriptures. All right. The next kind of law is the natural law. Now, revelation is not common to all because you have to be a believer. But natural law is common to all because the natural law is a law of God as understood by human reason. And since human reason is common to everybody, then everybody has the capacity to understand the law of God. This is the natural law. Okay? That is the natural law. First, the natural law is very broad. All right? We can say we can have the natural law as applied to the environment, to nature biology right so like for example uh say the reproduction of creatures that's part of the natural law like for example in the case of human reproduction when the egg is fertilized by the sperm cell then the result will be of course a human offspring that's the natural law okay now should we defy the natural law well we should not defy the natural law people defy the natural law, but we should not because that's that's the law of god okay so it's against reason to kill okay to kill because the natural law says that we have to preserve life okay everybody understands the sanctity of life based on reason okay so that's part of the, so when the law applies now, not to the propagation of life, but to the conduct of human behavior, it becomes a natural moral law. So the natural law that applies to the morality of action or conduct is called the natural moral law. Okay. Then below the natural law is the human law. The human law is the ordinance of man. The law promulgated by man, which could either be legal, meaning that's a law uh, made by civil authority, or the second type is ecclesiastical or canon law, the law of the church. All right. Um, in Islam, it's it's there's a, it's different because in a Islamic state, the legal, right, the human law, and is based also on the ecclesiastical law. The Sharia law is, is a combination of the of the two, okay, the civil and the 
ecclesiastical. Okay, so that's that's one particular uh, difference between uh, in Christianity because they make a distinction between uh, the legal, the church, or legal, the, uh, the, the state, and the ecclesiastical or the church. Right, but laws made by man are human laws, and of course, because it's a law, it's also an ordinance of reason. And as a law, it should promote justice, order, protection of rights, uh, individual liberties, etc., etc. When the human law becomes unjust, it is not a law at all. According to St. Augustine, an unjust law is not a law because a law should be or should serve justice. So if it's a law that will undermine or compromise the rights, the lives of people, then it is an unjust law. Unfortunately, we have so many unjust laws, right? Okay, now, so one of the standards in Christian ethics or Christian morality is the law. The other one is conscience. We're going to talk about that later in a different uh, lecture. So. That's the connection between the law and or ethics and law. And therefore, because some laws are unjust, some of them are not really moral. That's why we say that what is legal may not be moral. What do you mean by legal? It follows the precepts of the law. But some laws may be unjust. And therefore, because it's unjust, it cannot be ethical or moral. All right. So if you legalize, for example, abortion. So in some parts of the States, or I don't know if in the whole of the United States, abortion is legal. But it is never moral. Because killing is against the natural law. Killing the unborn is against the natural law. So abortion may be legal, but it is not moral. Okay, so there is a very complex relationship, very complicated relationship between ethics or morality and law. Okay, now let's go to a particular topic about how we reason. Okay, how we reason. Because how we reason morally will depend on our cognitive, the level of our reasoning, right? So remember, we say that the law is an ordinance of reason, okay? But of course, we have different levels of maturity when it comes to reasoning. When you were younger, of course, your level of reasoning is, well, let's say different or lower than the level of reasoning of mature people. So there are different levels of moral reasoning. Our reasoning about whether something is right or wrong and the reasons that we provide to things that we consider to be right or wrong. So there is this particular psychologist, Lawrence Kohlberg, who theorized about the levels of our moral reasoning. Lawrence Kohlberg was influenced by another psychologist, Jean Piaget. Jean Piaget. Those of you who are in the in the in the sciences, in psychology, in nursing, probably know Jean Piaget. Okay, Jean Piaget theorized that there are levels of cognitive development in children. So we start from the sensorimotor then the pre-operational, then the concrete operational, and then the formal operational. These are stages of cognitive development, okay? So we, our cognitive develop, development is, starts from when we were young, birth to two years old, <clears throat> it calls the, the sensory motor stage. And then from two to about five or seven, we have the uh, pre-operational and then from seven to about 12 you have the concrete operational and then 12 up you have the formal operational we are not going to discuss that in details but just to show you that there are levels of cognitive development now Kohlberg was influenced by 
Dr. J. And he thought maybe you can, we can also discover levels in moral reasoning, okay? So he studied children. He, he studied their reasoning when it comes to moral issues. And he considered the children to be moral philosophers because according to Goldberg, they develop moral standards or reasons of their own. So if you ask the children, for example, why they would consider an action to be right or wrong, children can give you reasons. So if you ask them, for example, why is it good to do your homework? Right? They will give you an answer why it's good to do homework. They will say, well, if I do my homework, then I will be able to, uh, I can show uh, something to my teacher. Or doing a homework, uh, if I do my ho homework, then I will have a, uh, a star in my hand or in my, you know, in my, in my arm. So there will be a reward for something good that is done. All right. But and not following your father or your mommy is bad because, well, there will be some consequences. He will not give me some allowance or I will not have my, my chocolate, etc., etc. So children, they have their own reasons for saying something is right or wrong. So these standards, these reasonings do not necessarily come from parents, but emerge from their cognitive interaction with their social environment, with their peers, with their friends, you know. Uh, social media, uh, television, right? So it's not just about the parents, especially in today's world. Parents have very less influence on their children. They are more influenced by social media, Facebook, Messenger, Instagram, or what have you, all right? So these are part of the children's social environment. So Kohlberg sought to determine whether there are universal stages in the development of moral judgments, okay? And he discovered three levels of moral reasoning. So let's discuss them one by one. So these are the levels and the stages, and then you have the illustrative behavior. So the first one is the level one, the pre-conventional morality. And the pre-conventional morality is divided into two stages the punishment orientation and the reward orientation. Now, in the punishment orientation, children obey rules to avoid punishment. And in the reward orientation, they conform to certain rules because they expect some rewards or some favors. Now, the question is, how did Kahlberg arrive at these levels or stages of moral reasoning. You know, what he did was to tell children stories, stories with moral dilemma, meaning at the end of the story, the children will be asked whether the action done by the character in the story is good or bad. Dilemma because it could, it could be good or bad, you know, it could be good or bad. One particular story that Kohlberg told the children was the story of a man whose wife was dying in the hospital because of a terminal disease. Let's call the man Heinz. So Heinz was desperate in trying to save the life of his wife. Because according to the doctor, his wife will, be, will die because of this disease. So he asked the doctor what he can do. And according to the doctor, he, he, they, they told him that, well, there is this particular pharmacist was able to develop a drug that could help your wife. So without wasting any time, Kohlberg or Heinz looked for this for his pharmacist and he found him at the outskirts of the city okay so he inquired about the inquired about the drugs but according to the pharmacist it's not yet in the reproduction you know 
stains and the the price the cost of doing uh, manufacturing is rather high but Heinz was insistent to get a sample of a dose a doses of the drug for his wife so he, he was given a price which was rather high and he requested that if he could just get some sample to be given to his wife but of course the pharmacist did not agree so he needs to give him the money the full amount so what heinz did was to borrow money from his friends from his relatives and eventually he was able to raise half of the amount went back to the pharmacist and begged the pharmacist to give him the drug but the pharmacist did not give him the drug because he said well i have accepted a lot of efforts here i have uh spent so much developing the drug and therefore uh i need the full amount of the for the payment before I can give you the drug. Okay, so it was Heinz was rather frustrated, left the place of the pharmacist, but in the evening went back to the place and stole the drug. And that's the end of the story. Now, the question of Colbert to the children is: Was the action of stealing? moral or immoral given the story given the circumstances was it right for heinz to steal what about the pharmacist did he do the right thing of not giving the drugs because of course he developed it and he have to recover his expenses etc etc you know the children gave different answers some say yes some say no some say ah bad pharmacies some say good Heinz but that's not the question here the question is why do you say it is good and why do you say it is bad and the reasons okay the reasons are categorized by Kohlberg into these different levels so children said well it's what he did was wrong because he will be punished well that's a punishment orientation the, some children answers that well what the pharmacist did was right because of course he he spent lots of money he was able to develop this drug that could help people he of course need to be rewarded so that's the that's the reasoning right now the second level is conventional morality you know when you say convention you are conventions are what use what people usually do the convention is the general practice all right the practice of everybody okay and if you do what is commonly practice people will say that's bad so the good thing is to follow the convention it's bad to not follow the convention what has been the common practice all right so the first level is the good boy good girl orientation you try to conform or try to follow the rules you try to do good things because you want to avoid the disapproval of others so doing the right thing is being a good boy and being a good boy is conforming to the conventions okay so if you heinz because he's he's a husband people expect him to do good so what he did was just right because under normal circumstances that's what other people would do so he becomes a good husband. Okay, that's the second. That's the third stage: good boy, good girl orientation. Now we are always after. We, we, we are always concerned about what will other people say. Okay, so if you are, if you are conventionalist, you may follow the dictum: when in Rome, do what the Romans do. Okay, follow what is what your social group thus the second stage is authority orientation well here you have a higher level of moral reasoning because you have hold laws and social rules because you want to avoid censure of authorities you want to avoid the feeling of guilt for not doing your duty so it's a higher level of reasoning because children say well it's the duty of 
Heinz as his as a husband to well, serve or uh, help his wife. So it's not about what other people say. It's what about what the authorities or what your duty dictates. The highest level of moral reasoning is the post-conventional. And for Kohlberg, very few ever reach this point. First stage is social contract orientations. Actions are guided by principles commonly agreed by people <clears throat> in the society or in the community as essential to the public welfare. So here you want to uh, retain the respect of your peers in the society, not just what, not what your social group says, but in the larger context of the society, the social contract. Right. So you respect the law because, well, it's based on the social contract. That's been the law. Right. So the children said, well, stealing is right is wrong because it's against the law. So you follow the law. You're not not concerned about what other people will say. You're concerned about the law. And the highest level or stage is the ethical principle. Your actions are now guided by your self-chosen ethical principles of justice, of respect, of love, etc., etc. So you go higher than the law. The law may say this, but, well, for me, it's against my principle. It's against my conscience. So the more mature children, when they were asked if what Heinz did was wrong or right, he said, well, it is right because what is at stake here is human life. Okay? So, obviously, the answer does not refer to the law, but to the value of life. And some children say, well, the, the pharmacist did something bad because, well, of course, he needs to recover some, to recover his expenses. but." At this, the, the situation calls for some sacrifice because the human, the life of a person is at stake. And human life is more important than profit. So you see the levels of, the levels of moral reasoning. Right? And as we mature, we, we also mature in the kinds of reason that we, we give to, uh, to justify our moral actions. See, so if, if, for example, if your teacher does not arrive within the prescribed time, the teacher is late for 30 minutes in the class. Is it right to leave the class? Some people will say, well, it's all right because he's already, according to the, according to the policy, if he or she is uh, late, then we can go. So it's a different level of reasoning, right? Some people will say, well, I will not go because if the teacher arrives, then he might uh, might give us plus points. We're thinking of reward. Okay. So the other, the other one will say, well, I will not leave because of this. The other one will say, I will leave because of this. So different reasons. Right? Some other people, some students will say, well, I will leave because I have some better things to do. Time is precious to be wasted waiting for a late teacher. So, different level of reasoning. Some would say, well, yes, I will, I will make the most of my time waiting, but I will wait here. I will not leave. So, you see different risk, moral reasoning okay so how we are going to apply the law how we're going to follow our religious belief and how we're going to act morally or ethically will depend on the levels of our moral reasoning okay so i hope you learned something from this lecture thank you very much for listening and for your uh, discussion you can uh, take a look at these questions, topics for our for your discussions.
Uh, today, most people tend to be more legalistic than ethical. Do you think it is better to be legalistic than ethical nowadays? Second, should ethics and religion be independent from each other, or should we go, should they go hand in hand? So these are your for your personal, you know, for your reflection. And what insights can we learn from the reasoning of children? So thank you again. Thank you very much for listening.